All right, so here's a Z80 based computer that is completely homebrew from start to finish and was likely built around 1977 or 1978. Everything about this machine screams homebrew from its slightly disheveled appearance, the wood grain, and the complete lack of concern for safety along the open back. Around this time, computers were becoming more available, more friendly, more appliance-like, and slowly but inexorably, hobbyist computer building was being supplanted by professionally manufactured products like the Apple II. So why would anyone expend all of this effort on this? Well, part of it was probably cost. A new Apple II in 1977 cost around $1,300, equivalent to around $5,500 today. That's a lot of money, although not cheese grater money. Whereas if you rolled up your sleeves and you did the work of creating something yourself, you could probably get in at well under half that, assuming you didn't burn your house down in the process. Plus, it gave you one more thing you could slap some wood onto. This machine came from an estate sale outfit on eBay, and I was immediately intrigued, of course, by the wooden look. I'm not sure what it is about combustible materials and electricity together that get me all excited, but yeah, I do love that. I also love the red Dymo punch labels. The ones that came before that are arthritis-inducing thermal variety. The entire machine is built on wire wrap cards like these, and they all plug into a custom wired backplane inside. I have a lot of respect for people who can do wire wrap. Personally, the thought of it, especially trying to troubleshoot it, makes me want to drink very heavily. I love all vintage computers. Well, except this thing. But homebrew are special because they are uniquely tuned to the preferences and skills and lack thereof of their owners. In addition to the wood, I appreciate the use of what looks like my grandparents' outdoor deck carpet that I barfed on in 1976. These feet are not Velcro. Okay, we'll glue that back on later, after I get a tetanus shot. There's also this row of seven segment LED displays. It looks like there were eight at one time. I have no idea what they're there for. Perhaps they were the primary display before the video card was built. That said, as a collector, one should be cautious, especially in estate sale situations where the original owner is no longer available. Homebrew machines often aren't documented well or at all, and in some cases can be downright unsafe. You've doubtless seen the, er, creativity of some car customizers. The same applies in computing with the added risk of electric shock. Anyway, without access to the builder, you have some heavy duty reverse engineering to do if the thing doesn't work. And that was the situation when I received this beauty, it just didn't work. However, I got lucky. I discovered by trial and error that pulling this particular card out caused the machine to start up. Nice. Who says the shotgun approach to computer repair doesn't work? Let's remove the wood and have a look at what lurks underneath. I'm not really sure what this is exactly. It kind of feels like a cross between veneer and laminate. All right, here's the de-skinned machine. This is one of the things I love about homebrew computing. All these different disciplines that come together to create a living, breathing computer. The keyboard here is a Claire Pender unit. I've seen these used in a few different places over the years. It's a pretty nice keyboard, one of those ones that almost calls you to type on it, even if you have no reason to. I think this dates from, I wanna say 1973 or so. There are four cards total for this machine. There is also a fifth slot that I speculate may have held another card. I'll explain why in a second. The first card is the CPU card. This has the Z80, PIO, or the EEPROM, and the custom monitor program, and a whopping one kilobyte of memory. The next card is the video card. This thing is heavy, like really, really dense. You can see a character generator and a row of 2102 RAM chips that give this card about one kilobyte of video RAM. That's about the same amount as the actual computer. The third card, I think, is sort of a keyboard interface. I can see the keyboard ribbon cable coming to it. And then there are some mystery sockets that don't contain any ICs, but the machine seems to run fine with them unoccupied. The fourth card is the one I showed you earlier, the one that was preventing the system from operating. It's missing a few chips and it has this little LED light. I've had some speculation that it might be an EEPROM programmer. In fact, it's possible this whole machine was dedicated to a single task like that, given how pathetically little RAM it has. Other possibilities might be driving the LED display out front. I suppose I could attempt to solve this mystery with a bit of detective work tracing wires and determining things like voltage pins and so on. The pattern would probably give a pretty good hint as to what it is. The power supply is over here on the left, and the terminal strip for it is just sort of lying there waiting for your stray fingers. The machine doesn't appear to have any connectivity, unless something plugged into those empty sockets for that. For ports, we only have a standard RCA composite jack, and what looks like a 3.5mm audio jack. Probably not for anything like tape output, since you'd need two jacks, one for recording and one for reading. 
Also, I don't see the circuitry anywhere for a cassette interface. The wire here doesn't go anywhere, so we really don't know. I'm guessing the metal frame is a total custom job, hacked, drilled, tapped, and fitted together by the original owner. Okay, let's put it back together and see how this all works. For this demonstration, I'll be using a Sanyo VM4509, which is my preferred monitor for my vintage computing gear because it can deal pretty well with questionable signal quality from old computers whose video outputs might not be perfectly in tune. And I'm sorry, my camera is a little bit too fast, so unfortunately you're going to see a bit of a rolling bar there. To power on this machine, you basically hit the power button above the number pad like so, and you're immediately presented with a ready prompt. But this isn't basic. The top of the prompt is a little bit warped. The horizontal sync on this thing is just slightly off. Kind of like my dogs. I actually dumped it and let the good folks at vcfed.org's forums take a look at it. They confirmed that it only has two actual commands, list and go to. However, they did find some additional cursor control keys. When you press L, you, uh, uh, wait a minute, what's going on here? Speaking of what, check out the error message. It's nothing fancy like syntax error or anything computery like that. It's just, what? It's like the thing is annoyed at you. Hey, I'm busy reticulating splines here, man. What? Hmm, I think my problem might be the shift lock. But I can't get it to come up. Maybe holding shift down will counteract it like on my PC? Nope. Ah, uh, this is one of those keyboards where the shift lock locks into place and it's only released by hitting the left shift. Okay, now we can do something. Okay, so list basically sets up 16 bytes at a time on screen for you to view or modify. You can just hit enter to move down the line here, or enter something in and then hit enter to carry on. In the process of figuring out the monitor program, the guys at VC Fed found a few control keys that help out. They allow you to move up or down the column, either individual lines or whole pages at a time. To break out of this data entry mode, you hit reset. The only other command besides list is go to which is spelled incorrectly here, either because of a simple mistake or possibly bit rot. Anyway, letting it go with random memory contents means it just goes berserk like this, and maybe I should back away. Now, if you're wondering why we always start at address 0400, here's the memory map the guys at BC Fed figured out. Basically, address 0000 to 03FF is occupied by the monitor ROM, and then 0400 to 07FF is available to the user. 0C00 to 0FFF is where the video RAM is located. Video RAM is actually two 512 byte pages, which you can actually switch between by using the page key. In this way, the machine kind of operates a little bit like the TV typewriter. You can edit one page or the other totally independently. Okay, so for a quick demonstration, let's enter the most famous program there is, Hello World. And again, many thanks to the guys at VC Fed. While I have considerable experience tinkering with and fixing hardware, I'm a terrible programmer. This program they devised will display a continuous string of hello worlds on the first page of memory. I'll post the uh, assembly version of the program so you can kind of see what's going on and follow along with what it's doing. Zero, zero C, two, one, one, seven. I gotta say this keyboard is nice way better than some of the other keyboards I've worked with on machines of this vintage. Claire Pendar usually does pretty nice keyboards. So what are those keyboards that you know like you, you just want to type on it as soon as you see it? <laughs> Fortunately I just don't know enough programming to really make this machine do much. Sure that I'm not getting lost here. D A zero one eight F zero. And then the last few bytes are the actual hello world message. Forty eight, forty five, four C, four C, four F, two zero, four seven, four F, five two. C four four two one and zero zero. Okay, so we've got everything entered. Let's hit reset and then go to. Obviously, I started at address zero four zero zero, so that's where we go from. And there you have it. Hello world. That's the first thing I've gotten this machine to do in the five years that I've had it. Next week, let's try some online banking. Okay, now I did say there was a second page of video available. 
After some consultation, I modified the program slightly to put stuff on that second page. I couldn't quite figure out how to get it to fill the page, but you can see here I got half of it anyway. So yeah, that's basically all there is to this little wonder machine. In terms of plans for it, I don't know. I don't want to mess with it too much as it's an historical artifact, but I'm kind of tempted to try and expand out the RAM a bit and maybe introduce a tape interface like Don Lancaster's BitBuffer just to make it somewhat more usable. I am learning how to program the machine in machine language, but it's a slow process. Anyway, thanks for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed this little tour of our woodtastic homemade computer.